Good morning and welcome back to the World Fair 2020 edition. I now don't have to call it inaugural. I mean, we're like eight days into this, so now it's like. Well, you said 2020. That might that implies yeah. that there might be more. I am. I'm thinking more. Well, it's been. Pretty what do you good. think? I the way it's been going. Um, I don't say year round, but man, this this has been I know. been going great. Eight days into live broadcasting, we've had one glitch, one show, and had to go 30 minutes later than we thought, which was nice. So we internet, it. it's we internet and it. it's Arkansas, it's, right? There's had to pay the cable bill. Yeah, there's a guy down in the corner with a cow in a barn that messed up my internet. So it, we messed up there. So this morning I am super excited. Salette has joined us to talk about kind of everything that you see in our shop. A couple of years ago, you saw the Collision Hub Studio go through a makeover and change in equipment. Uh, we brought Salette in and it's been an amazing relationship and they keep changing equipment out and some stuff I don't want to let go and some stuff Bob keeps trying to take back from me. So uh, what we wanted to start with this morning is to talk a little bit about pre-measure. Um, so there's a couple different ways that we use the nausea and we thought well we'd set it up and show it more in a blueprint format which is two post lift. Right. Um, so a lot of people haven't seen nausea, a lot of people haven't seen it work. So let's just measure a car. We've got our Altima in here. Okay, so uh, Greg will go through the setup of uh, basically what we did is lift the car in the air, drop some undershield so we could have access to measuring points, and uh, rolled the gazelle under, which is the trolley that holds the nausea rail when it's not, not on one of the frame machines. So Greg will go ahead and go through the setup now. Uh, it's a quick, quick setup for the, the rail to, uh, to make sure it's level and um, placed and, on the gazelle. An initialization kind of process. Okay. Correct. Okay. Yep. All right. So. Take it away, Greg. Now, one of the things I like about the nausea is a few different things while Greg's working there is that the system constantly calibrates itself. So there are some systems on the market where occasionally I have to send them back for calibration to the manufacturer. But this thing's constantly leveling and it's constantly calibrating itself so that I know every time I go to measure that the, the, I'm starting from the right spot, right? Right. So uh, what Greg is doing now is he's supporting the rail so that there's... Uh, there is a little bit of flex to the rail, with, as with anything when you move weight over it. The driver files that are in the program are specific to this serial number calibration at the factory. So when he levels this rail, the supports are in the proper place or the same place as they were at the factory. Right. So we know that a little bit of flex in the rail. Um, on one side, there's a wheel that counts how far the, the head rolls. On the other side, there's a laser beam that counts the holes on the rail. So if those go out of sync, we get an overspeed message on the screen that says, hey, something's out of sync. Is, is the roller dirty? Is the hole clogged? Did, did something get in one of the holes? So it's always a quick fix. Um, but to actually check the measuring head to make sure it's accurate, we provide this measuring tool with every nausea. And uh, we'll have Greg show it to us um, and actually do the measurement so we can see the um, how we calibrate. Right. So one of the things that you can do, so there's a lot here while Greg's working. Keep on working, Greg. We got a lot to talk about, right? So, <laughs> hey, so, so Greg's going to launch the software, okay. look up the car, and um, I'm sure the audience can see his screen at the same time. Yeah, so we're going to share the screen and we're going to show the process while he's working on it. And, and I want to step back a couple times because we just did a series. We did, I think it, was, it ended up being a three-part series on how to choose a measuring system. And we yeah. broke down what you got to look at. Um, you and Jason sat down and had a good talk. Each one of those notches on, on that rail. So my measuring head, so my nausea, has a specific serial number. And that serial number is matched to that rail. Correct. And they are paired and mated at the factory. And they have their own driver file. So Correct. Super, super specific. And as and one of the things that you guys measured is you know what flex is going to be in that rail. So my system is automatically calibrating and allowing for that flex. So Greg entered Greg entered the uh, the measuring diagnostic tool section of the software, and he's going to actually go ahead and measure this bar now this aluminum che checking bar that we provide with the system. Okay. We're going to go into the settings real quick and try to get uh, refresh the duplicating feature. Okay. So to make sure that, that it's duplicating over to the broadcasting. Give us one second, Greg. Broadcasting box. Um, but is by that doing... that Arkansas internet thing again? It pretty is. And the guy and the cow in the barn's back out again. 
Um, now the bar, Greg, that you're showing and showing is going to have specific. We know what those notches in the bar have a specific measurement, yes. and that tells me when I hit those bar, those notches, the computer should tell me a measurement that matches what's on the bar, right? right? Within plus or minus. Okay, and that lets me do point to point. So earlier in the week when we were measuring steering columns and everybody's seen the picture, I can measure steering columns, I can measure anything point to point That's with correct. my nausea as well. Right, so if we drop a cradle out of a car, we have it on a, on a stand, we can do a, an X measurement across the cradle to see if there's any damage to it while it's just laying, laying out of the car even. Right. So we can measure yeah. uh, control arm. My work here is done. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm out of here. You, you said did, you're not technical. Did you hit the side of the computer three or four times? <laughs> yeah, I used a bigger hammer. I used a bigger hammer. Right. So Arkansas Internet guy is done with that job. He's signed back in as a collision well, hub. We had, to, we had to bring the Wisconsin guy in to fix the Arkansas Internet, right? Um, so now he's getting that and making sure. So there we have it, and it's matched up. So I know. Can we, can we get a shot, a close-up of the bar to show the measurements on the bar? Yeah, I think so. <coughs> we may need to take the bar out, and then I will. I'll get this held up in here, yeah, and see. Zach, can you bring that in on me? So, as you can see, I've got the, so the measurements got, here. Right, we've got two sides to the bar. So here to here versus here to here, and I get two different measurements. Correct. And I know that I'm calibrated. Right. So, so. Uh, Right here we've got 360 millimeters plus or minus, and then here we've got uh, 359.8, so we're, we're in spec. Perfect. Good to go. All right. I and mean, that's the one thing I like about the system is I know every time, you know, if I go through my pre-calibration checks and do everything before I measure the car or before I start my day, I know that my system is 100% right. I'm dialed in and I'm ready to go. Right. Okay. And then, okay. so. With our measuring system, we have we talked about the laser sensor and we talked about the wheel, the counting wheel on the side. Mm -hmm. Then in the measuring head itself, and we talked about this when we did our measuring sessions, you know, if you look at a, a compass, it's 360 degrees. So that's a lot of little lines to break up that circle. But we've got over 1,400 checkpoints in that sensor in the head. That's pretty, that's dialing it's it pretty, in. Yeah, right. It's pretty dialed in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so as you see, we're measuring, you know, you know, tenths of a millimeter, right? Right. Um, then the next sensor we have is on the arm, which lifts up and down, so we know the angle of the arm. And then, Greg, <coughs> if you want to show them the actual pointer or the... Uh, so <clears throat> we measure, you know, over 180 degrees with that sensor. Mm -hmm. So where some measuring systems, you have to be at a 90 degree to the car to measure, we're able to actually measure at, at any angle that pointers at. And that's also, but beyond that, so beyond that doing a full flip, right, and going up and down, the attachments also give me extra length. Correct. And then give me movement at where the attachment goes. So I can go up, around, and kind of over and get around a lot of things. Right, so we've got the carbon fiber extensions, different lengths and uh, different shapes. And now what's really cool is these are all specifically machined for my nausea and they go with my serial number and on my driver file. So it's not like these Correct. are just spare parts sitting around in France that you guys ship me. Right. Yeah, so each one of these But I'm okay if you want to ship me some spare wine. <laughs> I mean, I just want to put that out there. <laughs> so each one of these, um, after they're manufactured, then they are calibrated with the rail, with the measuring head. So... Um, if this carbon fiber was cut a tenth of a millimeter shorter than the last one, it doesn't matter. They're all going to measure the same because they're all serial numbered and driver filed individually. So the driver file comes and I update my system to reflect the extension? So when, you get, your, when you get your software, everything is on that USB key, mm -hmm. your software, your driver files. Right. Um, everything is included. And that's my, I mean, it really is. It does look like a key. It's kind of awesome. <laughs> um, but uh, but it makes you know you think about it. If I'm going to cut a hundred of those pieces of carbon fiber as the blade changes throughout the day, I mean we all get that makes sense to us for for body repairs and stuff. Um, it, a millimeter measure matters in collision yeah. repair these days, and especially when we're thinking about structure related to ADAS and stuff. So it's it's I like the fact that I know that everything here is mine, and I know that sounds crazy. But it's mine, and it's right. serial number specific. And when you guys look at that rail in your or that attachment in your system, it says 
that's Collision Hubs, and I, I just think that's I really that cool. Is, yeah. <laughs> I think it's really cool. And then the other thing that you were mentioning, Kristen, is the adapter. So um, there's a, an open spot on the spring. So when we clip this onto the, onto the probe, um, we're, we've got you know, full movement because of that opening. So it allows, allows us more, more movement when we're measuring. Yeah, it's allowing me to get to places without having to take, I do have to take some stuff off, and you will with any system. You're gonna end up taking some shields off. You may have to occasionally take a wheel off, et cetera, but I can get around a lot of things because the computer and everything being talking to each other is telling me specifically what angle I'm at, and it's taking and doing all that math for me and then giving me my measurement back. And <laughs> you don't want me doing math. <laughs> right, so that's, that's the other thing is uh, the plug here do I need, uh, hold on. <laughs> yeah, we need some extras. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you have to take your sock off. Yeah. So, um, no, there's holes in them. It's good. <laughs> the, the other thing is uh, these plugs are coded. So every extension has a plug on. They're all coded. So when, when we change the arm from one arm to another arm, we never have to tell the computer that we're yeah, doing Yeah, I don't that. have to go back to the machine, is. and I love that. So if I, as I'm measuring around and I know what I need to do, as I plug and play, the computer's automatically knowing, okay, Kristen just did this, and it's not me having to go back and say, I just put this attachment with this arm on there. Now, okay, let's go measure. Right, or um, math. More math. <laughs> right. Done, if I gotta do math. All right, let's go. Okay. So Greg's gonna go ahead and, uh, and um, set this up. He'll look the vehicle up for us. Now let's talk about the database. So, um, Nausea drives other things, right? We use the Nausea database to drive Chameleon, which we're gonna be looking at next. Correct. But talk to us a little bit about what you got in the system for people, because a lot of people wanna know what coverages does Solette have for measuring, because I think, I think when a lot of us think Solette, my first introduction to Solette was European shops, was spending a lot of time with Larry in his shop, right? And I'm looking at Mercedes and Audis and these things, and I kinda had a, I kinda had a, a, a misconception that that's all you guys worked on. Well. And that was the case um, years ago, especially for the U.S. market. Uh, Europe was, was different, um, but for the U.S. market, we were primarily the, the big European names. You know, the Audis, the Volkswagens, the Volvos, the Mercedes, BMW, um, Porsche. Um, and then, you know, then we got into the Tesla business. But um, we were only touching some of the market. So um, then we launched uh, international international um, data capturing. I don't know if I have seen part of it. Yeah, we must have lost sound from being plugged in. Ah, Sounds okay. probably over, probably over, over there. at the yep. board. We're good. Ta ta. <laughs> so he can't hear his signal if he's actually measuring. Yeah, so there's an auditory signal that we're, with the HDMI out feeding to the broadcast, is you guys get to hear the ta-da. We don't get to hear the ta-da here. <clears throat> uh, but that so, auditory... So then we de yeah. developed relationships with um, General Motors mm -hmm. to capture uh, their CAD drawings. Um, Ford. And then there's certain companies that do not allow their CAD drawings to be given out. So in those cases, then we go and we measure those vehicles. Um, so this coming year, uh, we're going to ramp that up even more um, across the globe. So uh, we've developed a couple new relationships for U.S. market to measure vehicles at. Um, so every day there's more and more data being entered. Yeah. Um, so the nausea currently is uh, everything is stored on the computer. So it's suggested that maybe every week you just do an update, pull down the new vehicle. The latest information. Yeah. yeah. Now let's go back, Jason. <laughs> You and Bob had a great discussion on CAD data, and I kind of didn't understand. I mean, I, I don't think I understand measuring systems fully till I watched that video that you two did. Can you talk a little bit about that and what? what yeah, well, we're, we're building the, the database based on that CAD file, measuring a cross section of vehicles, which there may be some variation, just like we were talking about earlier about you know making the, the adapters themselves. There's going to be some slight variations in there. So vehicle A may not match vehicle B, C, D, E, F, and G. But if we've got the CAD files, then we can build that CAD file to specific to the vehicle. And it, it helps with the accuracy and ensures that accuracy a little bit more, a little so bit tighter. Tolerance. What are some of the dangers if I'm, if I'm using a measuring system that maybe has just got all of its data because they've measured cars post-production? What, what might some of the problems I might run into with that be? Um, accuracy, for sure. 
you know, CAD drawings, you're working off as, you know, zero tolerance, um, where there could be shipping damage. Um, then there's some build tolerance allowed at the factory. Um, so it just, it stacks up. And, and we had done a, a demonstration kind of talking about all the different possibilities. And by the time we got done, we had, I think, like close to 10 15. millimeters, yeah, 15, 10 to 15 millimeters yeah. difference potentially from, again, that original CAD file. And again, vehicles are built in different locations. They're, like you said, they're shipped. Um, you know, maybe there's a, a bolt that's put in, you know, a little bit, there's, there's just a ton of different right. variables. First, if we're starting with that CAD data, we know we've got that zero line base and we're, we're and, solid. And the other thing is, you know, every time the part comes on and off the jig, it wears, it wears the jig a little bit, you know, so if it's a, if it's a jig, jig that goes in a pilot hole and, you know, after thousands of times of the part going on and off it, the jig gets smaller, so now the, the tolerance is actually, you know, right. bigger. So everything, you know, stacks up. So CAD right. drawings are definitely the most so, accurate data. So to think about that, if, a, if an OE says that zero is perfect and I can be plus or minus three of tolerance, that means a car could deliver off of the factory line anywhere within that six tolerance, right? Three in this way and three that way. So if I get a vehicle that comes off the line and it's three a specific way, which means it was still in tolerance, but it's already off three because it's not zero. So it's not perfect on where the CAD what drawing was. And then I put a measuring system on that car that says it has a plus and minus of, of five to seven, and then they measure it, then that's a big difference. And in the world of ADAS, and it's thinking that I have, you know, ADAS is made with the CAD file, so to speak. <laughs> And, and I'm already starting that far off, or I repair to that far off, thinking, well, I got it within plus or minus three, and the, you're still not there. And then even the person measuring it too, right? So I mean, you know, maybe they're out late last night, or they, you know, they, they've been shooting a World's Fair for a week and a half, you know? <laughs> and, and so, you know, there's a little bit of technician there. So again, it just keeps adding up over time. And so again, you know, garbage in, garbage out potentially. Yeah, and, uh, exactly. So we all make sure that we're dealing with the- So where are we at, numbers. Greg? Well, we have a base measurement here. We can continue to measure the entire car if you'd like. But as you can see on the screen, we have uh, the center section measured uh, the, and the cradle in the back is completely measured. How are we looking? Looks good. All right. Well, this one was, if, if we flipped it around, or if you saw it on the pre-fair shows, this one is a rear end hit to a brand new Altima. Um, this is a 2020, Jason? Yes. Yeah, so 2020 is in the system. I see a lot of people posting, you know, I got a system that still doesn't have, or even I think some of the estimating systems don't have some of the 2020s even in it yet in the estimating system. So we have the repair data that we need for a 2020 Altima. So that's a Nissan product. That's not a Mercedes Benz, yep. you know, or an Audi or whatever. So we definitely can get those measurements. And this is quick and easy for Blueprint. So you can see how fast Greg just got the measurements. Um, it doesn't take me very long at all, much effort to know when we talk about pre-measure where I'm at with the car. We got a Larry, do I just pre-measure the cars that I think are going to have problems? No, you should pre-measure or pre-repair measure every vehicle that you work on in the shop, uh, unless you know the history. I mean, if you bought the car brand new and you've driven it and stuff like that, and you know you haven't been in an accident, then you probably don't have to measure it because you know the car. Or if it's a brand new uh, vehicle that had some sort of damage coming off, uh, um, like the truck, and just scrape the side of the car or something, and you can do some cosmetic repair, probably don't. But anything else you don't know the vehicle's history you and, and many times you'll find that it was repaired once before either properly or more than likely probably somewhat incorrectly and there'll be issues there they could have hit a pothole had somebody replace a tire cars hitting the rear and you're like well how does this damage happen in the front and that's where you first notice a loss or the information that you get from the consumer uh, or the vehicle owner on how the accident actually occurred oh no no, no. i was sitting at a stoplight and someone hit me in the rear okay, why we have some issues with the front suspension. Oh, I hit a pothole three weeks ago. I had to buy a tire and rim. Oh, okay, well, that's not, you know, I can't let that car go. It's never going to take a wheel alignment, but now I understand what's going on because what will happen is a tech will come in, he'll get involved in the back of the car and never look at the front in many cases. And that's why you have to get it up in the air. You have to look at everything. Right. You do a comparative measurement of certain uh, items. You, you measure suspension. Um, because if I measure suspension components or suspension mounting areas and I find an issue, I'll know up front. I won't find out at the end of the job after it's been there a week, two weeks, three weeks, the wheel alignment guys gets it and says, okay, you fixed the back, that's great, but guess what? I can't put a wheel alignment on this car. Why not? Well, the, the front strut tower won't, won't align for SAI right. and, and camber and caster, and I can't get the measurements in, you know, that I can't get the degrees in, 
And then you find out, well, the strut tower is out of whack. Right. Because she hit a pothole, she blasted out the suspension. Yeah, and without an effect, without an accurate repair plan, we can't repair the vehicle properly. No, no. And without measuring the vehicle, we, we can't, can't develop an effective repair plan. You can't, so it, know, it, it used to be, it used to always be, you see an estimate written on the street years ago. Not now. But like, you know, the car's hitting the rear like this. They go two hours set up, two hours pull. And then you go and you go, okay, I'm not pulling anything because I'm changing the rear body panel and the quarter panel, right. which are both damaged with the taillight pocket. What am that's, I pulling? It's from a four pole. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's, <laughs> it, you know, there's no such thing as a four pole. <laughs> but that, so here's the important thing. I would love to say that you're going, that, that while I tell you you need to pre-measure every car, that you're going to magically get paid for that. I can't make you that promise unless you want to do RTAs and go to court and do some of those things. But I'm still going to pre-measure the car because it's the right thing to do and it ensures. Now, when I do pre-measure the car and find damage, well, obviously then it's a whole different story. So I wanna make sure that the measuring equipment I have in my shop facilitates quick and easy measuring without taking up the bench. But I don't wanna buy a bunch of different systems and have that, that's a lot of cash flow for shops to invest in. Now, Bob, if I wanted to take the, the nausea and take it over to my bench, does it go, does it fit on that? Yes, it does. If I wanted to take my nausea and take it over there and put it on my, what I consider for my fast track repairs, my lift over there, does the nausea fit on my X track lift? Yes, it does. So I can take that off of the gazelle and put it in what we would think of a more traditional measuring system place and move it around the shop. And every time I move it, it recalibrates itself, right? Right. Once we go through the setup, it's calibrated. So I don't have to worry about, well, you know, Kristen, if I take it off the gazelle and start moving around the shop, I'm going to damage it, break it. It's going to get out of calibration. I'm going to get bad measurements. Right. And we watched Greg do the process on the right. gazelle. The process is the same when you move it over to the Griffin bench, the 7E bench, or the X-Track. Yeah. So people quick. ask me all the time, Kristen, why did you put Naj in the shop? Well, that's why. Yeah. Because it can be my blueprinting tool. It can go straight to my structural bench when I need to be doing... Um, you know, measurements that are a little bit more, um, I wonder what's the good word for them, a little bit more detailed if I'm going to start actually repairing and pulling or whatever. Um, so it's definitely a good system. Now, are we, are we ready to go look at system two for measuring slash repairing? We can. I don't know how much Greg measured on here, but it looks like he actually saved his report. Um, yeah, I don't know if they're sharing the screen right now, but um, yep. yes, they are. So Greg's actually entering some information for damage report. And we're good to go. All right, so let's get over and talk about, one, the next bench that I can put my nausea on, but we've got something else on that bench today that we want to talk about that's also a measuring tool. So you guys get over there, right, and I'm going to kind of talk through that. So at multiple times yeah, during the repair, screen, right, so either if I'm in blueprinting and I'm just I'll trying to get an idea of what I need to put on the estimate the or plan the, the repair box. for logistics purposes, right, then I've got to take got, that at some point out of this oh, two-post right. lift and take it through this, Google, the process. So it's if it's not fast track, in other words, it's actually going to have some structural repairs to it, like. it's going to hit a bench. And Soled has a couple of different options for bench. Now we have the Griffin and the Roan, which are more drive-on style benches, things that everyone's familiar with. And for most of us, we're oh, used to the it. traditional anyway. Savine style that we see yeah, running around. And that's for the Sprinter around. Mercedes program. And a lot of us think that that's a little overwhelming because that's a full fixture. And we would put the car up. We would put the bench under the two-post lift. We would lower the car down on it. And that's like, ah, I don't know if I could put that in my system. Well, the Griffin and the Roan have taken that out of there. And the, one of the reasons I have the Griffin um, in the shop is because it actually comes with a built-in lift. So you're going to be able to see how this works behind me. But for also a lot of times, we thought that Solette meant fixtures, and that meant renting fixtures and having fixtures shipped and having them forklift from the curb and into the shop. And while that still applies for some of my European models and for some of my repairs, Solette came up with a better system for that, and it's called the Chameleon, and it is a universal fixture system that allows me to really put any vehicle in what I traditionally saw as those fixtures that I would rent and do at the same time. So on, us, on behind us, again, we wanted to show off the versatility of the system. We're going to do a GMC terrain. So you guys have seen the terrain setting in the shop for, for I think the eight days of the World Fair that we've had. And that terrain is going to go in a universal fixture system. So we're going to drop it down. That fixture system can also be for measuring. So if I decide that I want to measure with my nausea, awesome. If I decide that I want to pull the specs and build the fixture system and lower it down like I used to with my rented jigs, then I can do that through Chameleon. So there's a lot of options there. 
um, and we're going to get through some of those today and I'm going to let Bob talk to y'all a little bit about what's going on back there, show a few of the fixtures built. We're going to go through the cabinets. If you have any questions about any of the systems for the whole rest of the show, whether it's we want to go back to the Naj and do some measuring or, or talk about any of the benches or lifts, we're happy to cover those today as we move around. How are the guys doing back there? Getting They're getting it ready? All right. Calibrating. You're calibrating? And when I have to leave the show up to them to, to calibrate, we have no telling what will happen. Calibrating the set. Calibrating the set. Ah, not the car. We're not calibrating the car. Ah, um, I do want to go ahead. Typically, we would have done a little bit more tear down on this terrain to set it up on the bench for fixtures. These vehicles were donated for the fair by Southern Farm Bureau. Um, they will leave us next week and go back to the yard for selling. And so we didn't want to damage or uh, hurt the ability for Farm Bureau to get any return on their salvage. So we definitely wanted to get these cars back in the same condition that they let us borrow them in. So we did leave the bumper and some other things on this car um, because we were, based on the front end damage, we weren't sure how much we were going to get back on and, and we didn't want to do anything that would cost them any money on the return during the salvage sale process. Um, again, a big thank you to IAA, so Insurance Auto Auctions, for helping facilitate that with Farm Bureau and deliver the vehicles. They've been doing pickups and drop offs for us. Um, for the last couple of weeks to get ready for the fair to make sure that we had the right vehicles in here to show all the different systems, meet all the OE obligations that we had throughout the week. So, are they getting ready for me? All right, let's go see what they got going on over there. And we got another 2020 model here as well. So again, just from a, from an update, and this one's got 28 miles on it. Yeah. So, so I, I I wanted to get the story on this, and this appears to be damaged during a test drive. That's what I'm guessing. So <laughs> so yeah, 28 miles. Yeah, 28 miles. 28 miles, <laughs> and uh, yeah, every bag blue, and it was actually a pretty significant pop on the front end. So, all right. So I was explaining over there that we have a couple different measuring options, right? There's what we just saw with nausea, and then there's what the more traditional is fixtures. Correct. And we, I could rent them and have them, you know, brought in. And that was when Larry used to beat me up and say he needed money to rent fixtures and forklift them from the curb to the inside and store them and forklift them back. And he's Pumpkins got changed. he's got 15 <laughs> lines on his estimate. And I'm like, well, hell, <laughs> you know. So, well, you know, it's hey. interesting because because uh, you know years ago the jig boxes would show up and you'd if you didn't have a forklift you'd have to empty the jigs out of the box. Right. Take the box off the truck bring it in the shop and then all, all the guys would carry the jigs in and the, the jig sets were like 700 pounds. It, yeah. was, like, it was like a 20 man operation because it's a big, it's like a, they call them gang boxes, like, you know, for construction or something like that. So the boxes are probably the size. So it's not Jimmy Hoffa just hanging out no, no. there? Okay. And, <laughs> and you're going to carry it. And you, fall, you can't well, have I mean, y'all are in Chicago. It. I just I had the, to ask. The so. newer stuff, the, the, the newer MZ stuff is a, a little bit lighter. Two guys can carry. You don't need a forklift for right. it. Right. Well, the you jigs, have most of the setup there now. Because the jig was one piece. Yeah. And it bolted directly either to the bench or to the cross member. Yeah. And then, then they launched the blue MZ towers. So then we went to a piston type jig. Um, and that, that shrunk the boxes down to, to about 350 <laughs> and, and then then they got rid of the piston and made it the jig where it bolted onto the universal the piston. Top. So now we just get the top piece and some bolts versus beforehand you I mean the old systems when you had to build every you know build them up and stuff I mean you had what maybe uh, 60 bolts and you had to look at each bolt to make sure that the last guy who rented them right. didn't strip and didn't do anything because yeah. then it wouldn't work. And you needed most of those nuts and bolts. You had your little checklist. You had to go down. Now these the, the newest systems a little bit easier because you have basically everything uh, the blue and the and the and the piston and the, the clips and then even the side gantry system and then the cross members and then you just get really the top pieces now yeah. uh, that are usually red or, or, or orange and you get those depending on the so yeah each the car, car has its own color yeah. but. The nice thing too is even with the new sets is they come in little carry boxes yeah. and everything's foam cut just like we have here in these drawers. So when you look in there, you could see, okay, like everything's see, there. You'll see this little L shape, you know, press out missing. Go, I think that's an Allen key. Yeah. You know, for some reason. So I got to get that back so, in there or this will be cut out if this is in there. Real, before we dive into Chameleon, which I, I know we want to get into, I, I don't want to miss the opportunity for you to talk about the bench that's behind us. Right. So I was over there explaining there. We have Griffin, we have Roan. Um, at one day, at one time, I do want to roan in here for the XL roan with the two lifts. I'm just saying. I just, you know. But, <laughs> but uh, the Griffin's in here now. And I, like, I w one of the things I did mention is I think a lot of people, when they think of Silette, they think of this traditional bench system. The car goes up on a two-post system and rolls down. Right. Most people don't know you have a drive-on system. Correct. Can you walk them through that a little bit? Yeah, so this is, uh, this is, let me 
our uh, flagship bench, really. This is our Griffin bench. Um, and I'm going to grab one of these. Um, I got one. Okay. I think we're, gonna, we're doing the same mine get, thing uh, here. We're on the same, same plane. But um, these, this decking can be moved around, so we set it up on the front here um, to get up inside the engine compartment. But normally these runways are, are down the side of it, and they're modular, so they come on and off. Um, lightweight material. And um, obviously we've got a big X lift underneath the machine to raise it up and down. Uh, this is our drive-on decking. Okay, so here's what I like about the drive-on decking, the reason I like to talk about it. Um, I've had other bench systems in my life. And as I've gotten older, and you know, I had some surgery this we've year. All, we've all gotten older. Yeah, <laughs> lifting things, you know, I don't want to have to get on my hip and try to lift it off and then carry it across the shop. I mean, I literally can take these off with one finger. And I'm not the strongest person in the world. So if I think about ergonomics, workers comp, happiness, ease of use, right. this is my favorite thing. And even when you take them <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> they're, easy, they're easy storage. Yeah. You know, they, they stack up um, nice and neat. They're, they're not real big. So, yeah. um, so we've been using this for, uh, well, I know at least since 96, 97. Uh, yeah, I think when you first the put the bench, I almost hurt myself. So Greg was here doing the install, and I walked over and thought it was going to be like my last bench, and I go, I got this. And I almost like smacked myself in the nose because it ended up being lighter than what I thought it was. But, but that being light, my, my clamps being built in there and not having to do, and being able to just kind of have all that in one place and drive the vehicle on. Right, so I don't I know if the camera bench. can see it, but the, the uh, silk clamps stay in place even when the decking is on the machine. Um, they slide back on an angle, so the decking would be here, allowing you to drive past these. So I can get the car, I don't have to ever take those off. So that's another thing that I don't have to lift and manhandle and mangle and try to get done. Um, and it's a fantastic. So I get all of the benefits of that bench that I was so used to thinking, mm -hmm. but in the format I love, which is drive on. Right, so we can actually take that, that roll around bench and actually put these lifts in it. Um, on all the newer benches over the last probably eight, nine years, they all have the bracketry and the um, rolling guides for the lifts already built into them. So right. at the factory, when, uh, when the benches are built, they're all built the same. They all come you know, off the same line. And if it's gonna be a Griffin, it goes to the right. If it's gonna be a mobile bench, it goes to the left. So. Um, and then with the lift in there, I'm sure, did you cover that? Not, I don't, not okay. yet, Okay, but we All will. Right. Yeah, <laughs> we'll do that next. So Come on, um, Bob. <laughs> normally, normally with the traditional roll around bench, we have to have the car up in the air and the bench moves underneath it to, to align it and the car comes down on top of the jigs. Well, with the drive on bench, we use this inner lift and uh, we left it up in the air so that we could see it. We didn't fold it back down flat inside the machine, but uh, we could grab the control, Greg. Um, the lift actually moves within the bench. So the lift goes backwards, forward, and it goes side to side, allowing us to line up the car to the jigs. So if I, if, so Jason and them, they always make fun of me. If I don't get the car on the bench, just square, just right when I'm driving it on, because I'm usually on the phone yelling at somebody while I'm trying to put one on the bench. So if I don't get it just right, I can move that myself and make my adjustments. Correct. Jason's like, yeah, that's how we get your stuff on the bench. <laughs> Well, it's just that flexibility, I think, is great. You know, it's right. just, it, it, it's well, just. Well, and I'm not going over here now and getting a set of bags. So yeah, I'm not absolutely. putting bags up there and trying to get the car up in the air with another set of bags. And that's something else I'm having to lift and throw on. <clears throat> I'm, I'm a big fan of not lifting. So. So the, the way that the lift blocks go, the rubber blocks, is we have a, a low setting. So it'll, mm -hmm. it'll come down on top of the arm low. Or if we spin it 180, we've got a higher setting. So. When you don't have a, a car that's got equal height uh, lifting points, you can adjust it. Oh, great. So we've got four of those, and then uh, the lift arms, the way that they're built, is uh, one end, we can have it at an angle to the lift, and then the, the other end, if we spin it around, it's straight. So we're able to pitch the lift arms out or back. Or, or at a 90 degree. Which helps me get everything in the, in right. the air. Fine. And then when you're not using these, they do store 
right on the side of the bench on this bracket. They're out of the way, but accessible. And my, yeah, like I said, my decking goes. I mean, so when we were loading this thing last evening to get ready for this morning, all of that stuff was there that you're seeing. So all that yellow was there. The decking was just on top of it, and we drove that terrain right up. Yep. Right. Now, we did talk about putting the nausea on the Griffin bench or the 7E. Uh, when you buy your nausea, it is provided with the, the actual brackets that drop down on top of the, the milled holes that are on the surface of the bench. And they've got the number on them. Tells you where on the bench they go. And you're able to put your nausea rail right on top of this just like we have it on the gazelle. Yeah, and for those who I know we don't have a straight shot up and down on the bench, but that machine surface, the silver top of the bench, has numbers on it. Correct. Um, and so I, it's, it's really almost like picture pages, and you count, okay, it goes here, and I put it there, and you know, and that's what the software does for me too, is tell me where it's going, what number, what angle, what, what everything. Right, and numbers are pretty simple. Everything's drilled at 100 <laughs> millimeters. I'll tell you this, if I can do it here, <laughs> you're good. <laughs> well, when we brought the chameleon in a couple years ago. We trained um, my kid, yeah. yeah. So I think at the time my son was 10. He's 12 now, yeah, so he's 10. And he was out oh, here man. building <laughs> fixtures. I didn't have to. I got a sticker. Two. I didn't even have to take my shoes off, <laughs> right? But, but I'm surprised I, you're wearing shoes. You're from Arkansas. Well, it's the TV. Usually <laughs> this, is, this is worldwide, right? I borrowed a pair, <laughs> and, and we're good to go. But no, he was 10 years old, and he was following along on the computer with you, and he was building yeah, the fixtures we set that up, you see uh, now. We set up a Honda Accord, I remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so if, my kid's way smarter than me, so, I mean, that's, yeah, but it is what it is, so. All right, so let's go through this, if you guys wouldn't mind showing. So now we've got it on here, we're ready to go, but we've got to build the Chameleon. Can you talk through Chameleon software, the Chameleon Premium Kits, what's all in there and how they work? Sure. So we'll have Greg go ahead and look up this vehicle. Um, can we capture the screen? Yep. We should still have a screen feed. So Greg will go through the steps to uh, look up the OEM, then, then the actual model. And this is, like I said, this is cloud-based, so it's live. So any updates that have been done last night are already on here when we sign in. Right, so as you're adding vehicles daily, as y'all measure or you get CAD data or whatever, every time I refresh my system, I've got the latest, everything that's available from you. Right. Perfect. And the unique thing too is um, if you work on, you know, some shops will work on a lot of the same vehicles. Um, once you set this car up and you save it on your account, um, your last settings will be there for you. So if you want to set the car up the same way every time, um, perfect. You can you can do it that way. You make an excellent Vanna. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, how much, how much for that on an estimate? I'm just kidding. <laughs> that would be um, per each um, uh, chameleon you would charge. <laughs> so that's my opinion on that one. Somewhere right now people are writing me questions. <laughs> what did he say? What did he, I didn't get I, it. I what did he say? Lips. What does he say? Right. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> muted Larry. <laughs> that's every show, Bob. That's, that's, that, that's that, that uh, little delete line there. Yeah. <laughs> We All right. for Kristen yesterday. <laughs> oh, yeah, boy. <laughs> I mildly lost my temper. I didn't lose my temper. I got on my soapbox yesterday. You did. Okay. Did. That's okay. Yeah, you were like this yesterday. It's like, you know, and you're. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm inside going, thank God I wasn't involved. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me I'm on was. Facebook while they're on live, and I'm typing. It's like I can't be both places. I didn't show up, so it's not my problem. Uh, officer, I wasn't there. <laughs> it wasn't there. I have an alibi. I have an alibi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have the vehicle pulled up. We've saved our plan from yesterday, and we are right back where we left off. There's so on the on the screen here. I have an alibi. <laughs> oh, sorry. We we can. She's checking. We, uh, <laughs> checking for questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> so we can add or delete um, jig points that we want to look at. You know, if we don't want to see the strut tower, you know, right. we can remove it because on this vehicle we're not using the strut tower jig. Um, so. Chameleon has a lot more jig points available than dedicated because dedicated you have to cut it off at a certain point, right? Say, you know, all right, we built 46 jigs for this car. You know, do we need 48? Right. Um, but when you're working off the software and universal pieces, we can 
have unlimited you know measuring points right so and I can work around things so I think you know one of the things that asks me when I get in there is you know engine in suspension in is any of that in the car okay great then you're gonna give me mounting points that help work around what I have right. so you're helping me facilitate the least amount of R&I that's needed to do the job right so sometimes there is some things I got to take off that's just the way it is but right. you're helping me make decisions that let me do the least I need to do to do it correctly still and then when when I'm under the car and I'm actually starting to work chameleon gives me even more play or movement to go huh I want to go this way and if I tell the computer I'm moving the target this way and this way you make all the adjustments and I just my job then at that point I like to say it's like Legos I'm just making it fit and then you guys in the system are doing the math and telling me where my measurements and okay you're good or no 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 you're not right so, so a, like an example would be um, dedicated jigs sometimes you run into like a brake line right Larry right you got to take the brake line off because the jig has to go up there and get passed around that brake line um, so if you're familiar with our system or if you're not um, we well, have we need some explanation about the bases the a B C D E F G H uh, um, arrows and even like sometimes the numbers that are on here for the different sizes of these maybe just go over that quickly so sure. you know they realize it's like an erector set in right. a way they give you a pattern to build and the erector set will go together by these pieces and it's it's fairly once you learn their little legend or their plan out it's pretty easy to put it together it does take a little bit of time because you have a lot of movement and bolting and stuff but it does you know you do really it, it is pretty simple yeah right with, with time I think that's one of the you know there's a, some intimidation there the first time you look at one of those sheets you're like what yeah. you know, what what's going on here but again like everything else we just we you learn, do, you gotta we do it in layers like it. all the all the European classes that Bob's been to that I that I go to that he's trained the instructors on it's put your crossbars down first then put all your bases down but don't bolt them put them in the right spot then put your, your, your you know your tubes in and stuff like that you and you work and you build layers and it's so much easier when yeah. you do it that way instead of trying to just build the entire thing in one spot each time and you realize oh this is facing the wrong way or right. I made a mistake so, so you read left side to right <laughs> side sometimes you look at it quickly but if you look at uh, a setup sheet on chameleon or if you looked at setup sheet on dedicated jig there's no reading right mm -hmm. everything's pictures and yeah. numbers numbers and letters don't wait that's for Learning me no math hold on and there's no <laughs> math it's like your animals you match the giraffe with the giraffe type of yes. thing with shopping like that well this is you match the a to the b and the you know the and it tells you where to put it <laughs> so it's um you know there there's not there doesn't have to be instructions in all different languages it's it's basically you're reading the picture right, right. so like larry said um this is the mz tower so when you look at the at the picture um well, Greg's on, on a different setup sheet, but you'll see the Greg, blue, the you blue tower. Greg, where'd you go? I took it to the map. <laughs> okay. Um, now, the blue tower's got a lot of information on it. There you go. Okay. By, by the way, We've this got, was also how we held the steering columns for measurements. Same. <laughs> yes, we, we, we actually jigged it up on there. We jigged the steering column. I just want to be clear that <laughs> that's how versatile the system is. We met our own chameleon. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, the one thing is we've got this triangle here, okay? Some people call it an arrow. I like to call it an orientation mark. But on the setup sheet, it'll tell you, does the orientation mark go to the inside, the inside of the car like this, or the outside of the car like this, okay? Because that gives us a 50 millimeter swing, okay? So it allows us, our, our engineers, to adjust accordingly. Um, this one here, if you, look, if you were able to look at it, it says it's an MZ80. So it means from the surface that it's sitting on to the center of this top hole, because this jig, this uh, MZ tower has two holes in it, to the center of hole number one is 80 millimeters high. Okay, so when it says MZ80, automatically you know, hey, it's a short tower, right? So this one's a 200. And so it's on the bottom here. Same thing from here to here, we've got 200 millimeters. Okay. Not that you have to measure it, but that's, that's, right. what, it, that's what it means. And then over here by Greg, we've got a, a 140. Now, so. there's you start getting used to them after a while when you, you know, like you, you do it enough times, you know which one's a which. Right. There's more adjustments, so that so that's great. So I got the 50 depending on where I point my arrow, but the base plates for Chameleon also offer more movement, forward, back, right, left. Do we have one of the base plates? We could grab one out of one of the bottom uh, bottom drawer of this one here. So I think if you look at the car, because we do already have this terrain and fixtures, if you look at the car down the side you can see where we have the towers and the towers are the different heights and they're on the base plates 
and you can see those base plates and how they fix um, and having the cars underneath there as well. So, so these towers have their own set of, of measurements in them and then they go on these base plates that offer me even more adjustments into the measurement. Right, so when we look at the piston and the MZ tower, this is all equipment that the shops Ooh. have had in the past. Uh -huh. Okay, so the only thing that we're adding now is the actual the base plate, the slide plate, right? Um, and then the MZ tower gets bolted to that. But we've made it, we've made it pretty easy. Um, if you look here, we've got a yellow column and a green column for our setup, right? And if you look at the, the actual slide plate, we've got a green side and a yellow side. <laughs> Again, this is why I have the system. <laughs> okay, this is built for Arkansas. Okay. <laughs> I, I just want to know, when y'all were designing this, were y'all over there talking? Were the two of you over there in France going, we got to make this work for Kristen, so we're going to need color codes. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, like Greg said, the other thing is uh, they are marked for left and right side as well. So we've got the L on, on each side of it for, for the left side. And then we've actually on the on the yellow plate here we've got an F with an arrow to the front. <laughs> oh, I thought that meant food. <laughs> oh. I kept setting my lunch in front of it on the bench. Hmm. <clears throat> so as Larry was showing you, um, they slide you know length and width um, for your different settings. Then your MZ tower will get bolted on top of it. Your piston slides in, tells you what plate to use. We have four different universal plates. And then this is starting to look like a, like a dedicated jig yeah, almost, is, right? Yeah. And then on top of it, tells us what adapter to use. Now basically here and here is like the dedicated jigs. And then this is the, for the most part, there's a lot of these adapters that are different from the normal just bolt directly here. You know, on the, or maybe well, sometimes you have that uh, washer that has to go on there sometimes. Gives the opportunity for clearance. Yeah. Right. Well, it gives you the universal clearance because it's not dedicated to it, yeah, so right. it's a little bit different. Correct. Now, I can use fixtures for measuring. In fact, that's the, you know, Select, you guys are, oh, 1953, I believe, is my first yeah. fixture bench comes out. Right. Um, so, fixture measuring and fixture, you know, has been around for, for forever, in a way, right? Y'all, I think right now I haven't found anybody that started this before you guys did. Um, but there's more benefits than just measuring. So when it comes to actual repair, especially with today's cars, fixture gives me repair benefits. What are those? Well, I mean, there's a couple of different things here. One is you have it locked into place. The car's not moving. I mean, there's very little pulling being done to vehicles nowadays, uh, which sometimes you're, you're inducing more damage into the vehicle or introducing damage to the vehicle by trying to pull it you know, uh, now, and not holding it. So, so a timeout there, because I remember you came down and did a class a couple of years ago, right? Yep. And if I, if I don't anchor the car right, if I just put it in some pinch weld clamps or whatever, yeah. and I start pulling, can I put more, like what Larry's saying, can I put more damage in the car than I'm taking out? Yeah, of course. I mean, that whole, that whole measuring and pulling strategies approach, you really, again, just not just like, let's just start tugging on this thing and see where it's going to go, right? We really need, again, that repair plan to go, you to have go to through measure, the whole process. You have to see what's there. Um, listen, uh, most guys will make a mess out of most, like that uh, F2, I mean that um, uh, 2500 series uh, pickup truck that we had here hit in the nose. They'll make a mess out of that frame. One, they don't anchor it enough, right. you know, or they don't have the proper anchoring equipment. I don't care what frame equipment they have. And w you saw a lot of this when you guys finally got on the Ford program and you built jigs for the first time for really an American pickup truck. Yeah. And, you know, that anchored stuff in and you could really see diamond a twist on those vehicles. And you could see if you could or could not remove it because, in fact, you might be able to remove it, but then you can't stress relieve everything and it actually winds up bending itself back into place again. So uh, that's what they don't realize. So six months down the road, you have a truck that's all twisted up again because you can't release all that molecules that way and it twists back. That you high, would, that high tense steel, yeah. It, yeah it overnight doesn't. it creased back on they went from after 50, they pull it. You know, 40, 50,000 PSI. Now they're up to like 60, 75,000 PSI on these things. They're, they're, they're an, uh, you know, non-repairable type of uh, uh, steel because they're, they're not high strength or low, low, low alloy anymore. They're almost dual phase in a way. Now you have a vehicle like this and, and um, we know the underside is good. We obviously can see the upper portion 
is a little whacked out of place. We didn't really get a good picture of it, but you can see it's all smashed in. So we know we need a, a rad support, maybe the front portion of the apron. We're assuming we didn't measure, we didn't do anything, we didn't go out crazy because we can't pull out the suspension if the strut tower is in the right spot. But let's say I was working on this car. What I would do in this case is there'd probably be no pulling to this. You know, everyone thinks oh, I'm going to pull. Well, I'm changing the rad support, the upper tie bar. I'm changing the baffle. That's both smashed. Providing the strut tower is in the right spot, which I would put the the jig in there for the strut tower after I remove the, the suspension out of the way. If that's in the right spot, what am I pulling? Right. Nothing. But now if I'm going to go put the rail in, I hold the rail in place. I have maybe one in the front here holding the front rad support. I mean, uh, holding the front like uh, this one, uh, which... rail in place. You know, the right. front bumper reinforcement. So now I know all my stuff's in the right spot. If I resistance weld maybe two spots and have now a B-Tech or a helper come in, hey, here's the magic marker marks, finish welding this off. He can't screw anything up because it's locked it's in locked place in. Yeah. that you can't move it. If I'm doing so, a B-pillar so. and I weld a few spots and I have the side gantry on and it's locked in place, you can't screw it up. So, so two things that you just Are mentioned. Are you sure? So, Are you yeah. sure? Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah. <laughs> so, so two things that Larry mentioned there. Just squeeze the trigger. Call me over. <laughs> two things that Larry mentioned there to, to answer your question. So the first advantage right there is you, you've got that fixture. You're holding that part in place. Um, so you, you get a little bit more action with your hands. You can, you can make adjustments. The other thing, that the huge benefit is you know it's in the right location. Yeah. So if I've got the tower built the way I'm supposed to build the tower, I know that that part's now in the right location. It's going to fit where it needs to be. I've got that, that I'm looking at the three-dimensional measure, which, which I really like about it because, you know, when you're looking at this, you know, some of the other the systems where you gotta, you kinda gotta visualize in your head, like, the measurements, try to, like, put it together. This one, it's, it's there or it's not. Right. If, it, if, if you're working on a vehicle, and I'll give you an example here, and, and you, you're testing it out and stuff, and this is supposed to fit in here. Yep. You know, this is a bolt on the car or something like that, and this is supposed to fit in here, and it's doing this. Well, I know, number one, if, if this can't slide up into that spot, I'm hitting it, I can't get that hole back in here where it belongs. I know one, this is too low, mm -hmm. and I can see it's forward. How many millimeters it is, I don't know. That's the right. one thing you don't have with a jig system because it just fits directly. Well, I'm gonna, I don't know the I'm gonna cut you off real quick. Go ahead. Because we do know how far off it is because the slide plate. Greg, can you take them to the report? So on this software, uh, this one will give it to you. we can actually enter the data off the slide plate. So we put the jig in place, we enter the data that we're reading off the scale, and it gives you the difference. And it'll actually allow you to do a printout of, for damage. So this is the first jig system. That'll do a report. <laughs> That'll do a damage report. Right. So Sorry to cut you off, Larry. That's okay. And when I, now if I, if I remove this rail with the bolt or this, this you know, I don't know, it, maybe it's something built onto the rail that fits in here. But I remove it and I put the new rail in with this on there. When I lay it down and this is in the right spot, now I'm locked in place. This can't move anywhere. And let's say I have this at the front to hold, like, you know, the front bumper reinforcement where it bolts onto. That's locked in place. This can't move. I've had a lot of people buy cars back because they weld stuff in the wrong place. They replace the parts. They even did the replacement procedure correctly. They just welded it in the wrong spot because they thought, the oh, I'm going to fix it on the maybe floor. Maybe the technician didn't weld it in the wrong spot. Maybe he measured it, maybe he set it up, and then he welded it, and he got some heat torque from welding it, and the part moved as he was weld, every weld he did, right. the part moved a little bit from heat torque. With jigs, you don't get that. Yeah. And With it, jigs, you eliminate all heat torque, and it keeps the part in the position that it's supposed to so, be from beginning to end. So I want to think about, like, so right now, what I'm, what I'm hearing as an estimator is I'm going to have my, my setup process, I've got a measure process, and now I also need to be thinking about an anchor plan before I get to figuring out what my pull times might be. So I was going to say if we, if we did pull some on this. So I got three things to think about before I start adding pull time. And does my anchor plan make pulling easier? Like, like if I get anchored right, does it allow me to pull a little easier than if I'm anchored wrong, where I'm pulling against the whole vehicle? Because if I, <laughs> let's just say, for example, the strut tower was out of whack on that side. I would have this side of the car with a couple of the anchors on it, plus I'd have on the floor pan in that area it anchored. Now I can only pull what I want to pull of the area, and it's not going to stress anything else right. as I, you know, And it also makes it pressure. easier to walk that part. So I mean, I think we've all walked into a shop and we see a tech over there with a chain and he's just 
broke, you know, and he's... And, he's, then, psh, and, and, and he's doing it all day long, and you see, you know, the pickup truck's been on there, or the SUV's been on there for four days, and this guy's coming in eight to five every day going... Brrr, brrr, brrr. And all he's doing is, is just jerking the car back and forth in the machine, and it's stretching going back, stretching yeah. going back, and he hasn't moved it a millimeter. Right. You know, except he's punched, you know, massive... Dents in the side of the <laughs> I know. I'll just hit it. Let me get a bigger hammer. I'll hit it harder. Hold on, you here know. I come. <laughs> Wait, I got to dent now in the rail. Oh, now it's staying in the right spot. I mean, you know, it, it's because I mean, no one really teaches how to do frame repair. No, repaid. and that's, that's uh, you know, we used to tell techs, uh, you know, when we would teach at the insurance industry, when we talk about pressure and what was on it. I mean, as insurance adjusters, we were saying, hey, if you're getting up above 1500 psi on your pull tower, you've done something wrong. You haven't anchored right. If you're really having to crank it up to pull the car, right? Uh, either your anchor plan is wrong, or that's not movable cut it off and let's replace it so that's most of the problem they don't anchor the car properly so no matter what force or what you're pulling with it's not going to work i mean i need it anchored properly to be able to pull it properly the comments on the sound effects we're getting right the motor boats right so, <laughs> so you know, like larry said i just wanted to do that we're not in the bay stop Go <laughs> <laughs> so if, if, like Larry said, if we're just sitting in four pinch well clamps, when we're pulling on this front rail, all the pressure's going yeah. through the rail, down, and it's trying to get to that anchor it's, point. It's another right? collision at that. Yeah. So <laughs> we're stressing the whole uh, car. A few years back, and I think Doug Craig was the one who had to write this when he was at F well, Chrysler at the time, um, you know, you had the Jeep and you had the Dodge Dot that were out. And they told you, you, you can lift it and hold it, mm -hmm or even clamp, but you can't pull by the pinch wall clamps. You have to anchor at suspension mounting areas with a, you know, with a, a bench system. Right. So you ha you couldn't pull by the four, you know, by holding it by the four corners. It's like back in the old days, and I'm gonna show my age a little bit, and you guys will laugh, it's the, like the old Corsica. You know, you go to jack it up, or the old uh, uh, Datsuns, you go to jack them up, and the rocket panel would crush. Right. Like a, oops, <laughs> I shouldn't have jacked it there. Um, because it's not strong enough. Yeah. And they told you, you can't hold it and pull it. You have to grab something in like the engine cradle bolting area, or move that bolt, put that, uh, a different bolt in there. Hold it from there to be able to pull it, because it's not strong enough in those rockers. That's American cars. So this isn't the you know the highfalutin Germans you need to put all these jigs up. You got American cars that have built this way. Right. I mean, look at most of the Chryslers. You, I think when back when you were at iCar, you had written a whole article about the DP600 on most of the front rails. It doesn't want to move. You're, you're basically chopping and changing a rail. You're not pulling it. So you know you have all these higher higher strength steels that aren't going to move, and you need to make sure you're very accurate when you put the stuff together because these cars are so strong nowadays. Uh, um, with motors and and, yeah. and, and, and torque, you get that torsional movement of the car. If you're off by a couple of millimeters, you might snap, break, rip, or tear something that was you know not intended to be that way. Yeah. So All right. We, so we talked about anchoring into like a mechanical you know point, and that's that's basically the, what this one is. So we've got our our flat jigs for underneath the car, our angled jigs. So this could be like a suspension point, um, and we could set this angle at any angle, any height. And we give you the selection of bolts as well to replace because you know we need a longer bolt to go through this jig right. and into the car because the one that came from the factories is normally not going to be long enough. And then we've also got this type of jig for the end of the frame rail. Um, and we can Just we can show you the assortment of parts. Yeah. The, so I mean, if, if we'll get in here, I, I mean, it really is as you go through it. I've kept all my paperwork. You should be proud. Um, everything you need to know. All of the parts. What's well, math? Um, all, <laughs> all of the parts are in the system. All of the connectors. Everything's labeled in here, um, so that as I'm following along on the software over there, you know that Greg's got pulled up. I can come in here, find the number, the exact call out. It's like an Erector set or, or Legos for me. That's what my kid kept going. This is like a Lego set. This is cool because you just follow along with the instructions over there. You know, as you you look at that screen on the right hand side of that screen is all the parts I need with the parts numbers. Um, I think there was a post that went out on LinkedIn yesterday. A shop had just gotten their chameleon kit in, and this was one of the things that they were like, check out the wrenches. Um, but, <laughs> well, that's but, another nice thing. They give you the right wrenches with this kit, so you don't have to go back and forth to your toolbox to grab a socket, a wrench, or anything like that. They already gave it to you, so you have it. And notice, you guys don't give us impact guns, right? No. No impact. No impact <laughs> sockets. No air ratchets. No. Uh, what? Why? Because you're not supposed to use. That's how guys break their equipment. Is they use impact guns. This is supposed to be, you know, snugged and tightened 
by hand. Right. Now, granted, somebody uh, um, a little bit smaller versus a little bit larger might tighten it slightly differently, but you don't have that amount of force that's going to start stretching these bolts and start tearing these bolts up or even the mounting areas mm -hmm. by cranking down on them. So that's why, you know, they're showing you that you have to use mm -hmm. hand tools. Mm -hmm. You're not, don't use air tools and stuff like that. It's just not going to work. You're going to ruin your equipment. That's also what ruins a lot of times the bolts that go down here. There's a plate for those who don't know that, that, that attach and stuff, yeah. and you twist that around, you gotta, you gotta buy new plate pieces. You shouldn't stuff. be making <laughs> sounds with that. Yeah, no. <laughs> no <laughs> doesn't belong yeah. over here. Yeah. The <laughs> Yeah. And, and the cart, I mean. Uh, oh look, I, I, I can make like music now. Um, Very good, different sound there. <laughs> this, is, this is not for whom the bell's told. <laughs> I had to get him on the origami last week where he was trying to do it. Um, the carts are real nice. You got this extra tray you here. Got a seat here. Um, they move around, you know, so I can put the parts here. I can build on top of it. I got, you know, the rubber padded surface on the top. Um, they roll around the shop very well. Everything's labeled for me again, serial numbered. So and they're all there's all cut out, so you you, you know. Not, not so much you know where you're putting the right. stuff back, but if something's missing, you know what you're you looking for. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you, know, something, right. you know, there's a little cut. It's like I like sometimes wall unit stuff or tools and stuff. You go, oh, I'm missing my pliers. Where, where did I put those? You know, like All so right. you can see it. Well, anything else we want to cover on Chameleon? Greg, you want to add anything? Well, I, while you guys were all talking, I was here. I, mean, I just went through the... He was actually working. He was while working. We're, while we're BSing, he's actually working. <laughs> no, no, I mean, there, there are other folks who are watching on the screen, and they can see the command screen, so I went through the program and, oh, cool. and showed them the different viewpoints that we have available. Okay, good. Okay, and then we also... There's another one that I did. Yeah, we can, we can turn this. It's right. basically a CAD drawing that we're yeah. working with here. And, we can and move I it do around. frequently, so I'm moving it around a lot. So I'd like, it reminds actually, me of my audit estimating could, system. If we I could capture it. the screen again, um, and I'd like mm -hmm. Greg to actually spin an MZ tower on the screen. Okay. Um, and maybe, maybe no zoom pressure, in. No pressure, Greg. No maybe, pressure. Yeah. No, that's easy. Maybe <laughs> zoom in a little bit on one and, and flip it around. But the thing is, um, we talked about like that, that bracket that's holding the brake line. And with the dedicated jig, we've we got to take that off. Well. On Chameleon, we have a couple choices because now we can actually we can slide we can slide the MZ tower side to side on the cross member. Um, we can spin it, so we just click on the orientation mark on the screen, and we're actually able to turn that MZ tower. And every time we turn it, it gives us a new measurement here yep. right. on our slide plate. So we're actually able to manipulate um, the jig a little bit to come in from different angles. Um, or even different heights. We can add a, a height extender on here. If you want to maybe grab a, a 120, Kristen. Now you got numbers now. Here we go. The big long one. The big or a 65 one. or something. But you want this one, AD um, 120? Well, I'll just go around the clock here with the yeah, we can, MZ tower first. Everybody's you know, the big thing is people have to realize the dedicated fixtures on, on symmetrical vehicles, you're going to have the exact tower on both sides going to be in the same basically configuration for the most part, unless it's something slightly different built into the vehicle. But they're basically going to be, I put this on the left side, I'm putting this on the right side. Mm -hmm. With these, you might have different ones on the left side and right side mounted at the same points because, like you said, you got a Correct. bracket in there, and one of them I might have this where it's almost like literally almost squared up perfectly. And then the opposite side might be one of these configurations like this, and it's all twisted out of place, and the arrow's facing a different spot because I can move it, and I'm trying to get around that bracket so I don't have to remove something on there right. that, you know, because uh, basically right. the CAD drawings are built with, it's a body of white, there's right. nothing there. Yep. So now well, instead of taking everything off, I can make it easier. So the, the beauty, I, I don't think there was anyone in the industry that ever doubted that fixtures was the best way to, one, measure car, two, repair it. Which is why when we came to cars with low tolerances, which was our high-end Europeans, this is what they wanted, right? And the American maids and the Asians, we always kind of factored in some tolerances, right? But there were some drawbacks to fixture-based measuring. There was the rental, there was the cost, there was the labor, there was a lot of things that didn't facilitate that and what we would have considered a production shop that's trying to run a lot through. And Chameleon solved all of those problems. Because now I have the best of both worlds. I have the ability to have fixture and to do and hold the car and do everything I need to do and have it on site where I'm not having to go place a, an order. But I'm also not adding that cost to the estimate, which then passes on to the, to the customer. So, you know, and the ability to make those, those little arrangements to have to not take brake lines off, right. all of that, you know, so I think sometimes we get criticized for saying, you know, when we do, we write expensive estimates, right? But we love when we find tools that let us 
not have to take things off. We don't want to. Every time I take something off a car, I'm liable for it now, right? right. I took the brake line off. That's a serious liability. I would like to not take the brake line off. So there's a lot of things that I don't want to R&I or I don't want to remove. There's a lot of things I don't want. I don't want to rent a $700 box of fixtures and have a two-hour to a two hour forklift charge and all those things that I have to have and shipping fees and any of that. And so Chameleon solved all those problems and really gave us, you know, the best repair method in a real, you know, in an on-demand and cost-effective format. So mm -hmm. right. that's what I liked about it. Cool. So when we, we add an extension like this, like this 120 extension, It'll give us a new pin height, right? Because now we've we've built this jig up, so where before it was the point was down here, yeah. right? Now we we put this extension on. We've got past that brake line, past that bracket, past that muffler, uh, exhaust pipe, whatever it is. It'll give us a new pin height. It might change our MZ tower, right? But it saves us the time of actually removing that It's part. doing the math for me, and, and just I wanted you to point out, Bob, is we had the yellow measurements here and whatever. I actually, as I spin these down, there's measurements here too. Correct. So and I'm telling the system where this needs to be dialed into. So it's, it's a fantastic little set. So, all right. Cool. Well, sometimes I don't need a full bench, but sometimes I need to have, I need to have a repair height that's conducive to the ergonomics of the technician, yes, right? Good. Makes makes the repair easier. And then Fancy sometimes I may words. have some little tiny light pulls to make, right? She looked it up. <clears throat> I did. I read it. This morning. <laughs> this actually. morning. You're welcome. All right. So we ready to go over to see extract? Yeah, let's take a look right, at extract. So I'm gonna take um, you, I'm fast gonna, lane repair type machine. Yeah. So this time we don't have to take the computer. We'll just leave the computer over there. And I'm gonna meet you guys over at the extract in a minute. So <laughs> occasionally, I don't want to say occasionally, I'd say daily Cars now are a little made a little lower to the ground, tolerances are a little tighter, panels are a little tighter. In the old days of technicians crawling around on the ground, using a creeper, doing the repair, um, even trying to think of welding some of the lower components on if I'm at the bottom of the quarter or the bottom of the rocker, I've got to get those vehicles up in the air. And, and we all want to keep our technicians happy and we all want to keep them employed and we all want to make sure that they're productive. And one of the things I can do for that is making sure that I have what I like to call are the light duty lift stations or light duty benches. So for me, they're more about the ease of the repair process for the technician, specifically when I'm getting into panel repair and replacement, but they are also available to do some light duty pulls. And that's what we've got extract for. So I've, I've got some shops now. I've got one in the Northwest that hopefully, you know, Logan and Alicia and Driven Collision up there's watching. And they've just bought 10 of these. And so every tech in, in the shop is going to have their own extract in their stall. But we want to talk about why lifts are important and what they can do. And we've got our Subaru on there. So we can basically, we can put anything on an X-Track, can't we? Put size down. Yeah. So what's the lift capacity? Uh, 8,800 pounds. Yep. So okay. it's, it's, got a, it's got a nice lift capacity. And uh, the one reason that it was built so heavy was that, um, as you've seen uh, last time we were here, if we had a, a car on this 7E bench, this mobile bench, and we wanted to lift it up in the air, uh, we can roll it over top of this X-Track there's two brackets that lay on the top of the, the machine and they go up and they, they hook into the bottom of the 7E and now you can raise raise the bench up this And that's high. one of the things I love about it. So if I was at a, if I was, you know, Larry at your shop, how many how many of those do you have right uh, now? Six, uh, 17 of the, no, 16. I got 16 uh, um, 17s and then uh, two Griffin Griffins. XL, right? Yeah, two Griffins, two XLs, a Griffin XL, one regular uh, X, uh, one regular Griffin, Another, and then two regular uh, 17 uh, XLs on there. So I think it's like 20, 20 or 21 benches all together. Right. You know, that they have. That's a lot. That's okay. <laughs> so for, for you at Mid Island and at, and at, you know, exclusive, when a car hits the bench and gets fixtured up, and a lot of times you're using still traditional fixtures. Exclusive for, has a, for a Porsche a, a and everybody. And a, a 17 right. XL. We have. So when you get a, a vehicle you have, fixtured you up. You have some chameleons in your shop too. Yeah, they got chameleons. Yeah. Well, both, both, shops have the chame both shops have the chameleons. Um, you know, to, to but you, but depending on the OE, you, you still are kind of using some We're true kits. Jigs, and, yeah. Okay, cool. So once it makes that, it's going to stay on there for a fairly long time. It's going to stay there through the repair process while the technician's welding and doing everything. Yes. Right. So I love the fact that I can either drive a car on like we've done with the Subaru today. I can put it up in the air. My clamps are built in, right? I've got wheel stands. So if I want to, once I get that car up, I can put my wheel stands in, drop it. It's in the air. I can do a lot of stuff on right. it. Um, or what you just mentioned, I can push my bench with my benched car over and I can lift that now in the air. 
Right. And so that can stay through the whole repair process. And the technician now, that's a much greater work height. Because, Jason, we were talking on the welding show about welding arms and getting in places. Well, if I've got that car down on the ground, some of these lower lower rocker panels, quarter sections, hard to make those welds. Yeah, the flexibility, again, I think is key. And that ergonomics that you mentioned, and again, it's, it's, it's keeping our technicians safe. It's, it's a little bit easier for them to work around it. It just, that flexibility just think is just, just fantastic. It's a conducive work environment. Yeah. Right. So, so the so. unique thing with this system is when we drive over the bench, uh, the wheels end up in, in the actual brackets, and then we lift the car by its wheels. And at this point, we actually, we would clamp this car with our silk clamps as the wheels sit in these pockets. So it's, it's a quick system. We don't have to take the wheels off. We don't have to raise the car off the bench. Um, we actually bring the silk clamp to the height of the pinch weld. Right. And my nausea goes on this one too? Correct. So if you look here, uh, this is the standard size silk clamp. And then if you want to work with nausea, then we've got the higher clamp. Okay. So for the higher clamp, we would use the wheel stands, which we see in the back there. We'd lift the car with rubber blocks instead of by the wheels, mm -hmm. put the wheel stands under the tires, lower, lower the bench down a little bit, and put these higher clamps on. So it's, it's an extremely versatile bench. I can, I can make light-duty pulls with it, so small front-end damages, small, small corrective pulls. I can put the car on there while my technician's doing his regular welding or whatever. Um, I can measure on this bench if I need to. So if at any given moment during the repair, I was like, ooh, hey, uh, yes, <laughs> let's take a look at something. Just they're extremely versatile and, and have a really decent lifting capacity. I've seen a lot of work benches out there, workstations where the lifting capacity is a little lower and, and I can't get some of your larger, you know, I, I like to call them SUVs or wagons. I can't get some of them on there. They actually exceed the, the weight capacity. Right. Now, the other thing too with the, with the extract is we, we refer to it as a light duty or a light pull machine. Um, it, it's actually a 10 ton, 10 ton, 10 ton ram. Yeah. Well, um, I like to say it's light duty because of what I, if, if I've got massive structural rail or whatever, I'm going here because sure. I want to anchor in completely. Correct. If I'm doing what I would consider, even though the tonnage capacity is high on the tower, this to me is more, I'm going to pull a core support over or, or do something like that. And, pull and that's of, the way we market it as yeah. well. Yeah. And, uh, Second thing is, is the tower is a 360 tower. Um, so this is what we call a dual entry, and that's all, all we're bringing into the USA. It's round on both ends. If you look on our website, you will see one that's square mm -hmm. on the back end, and that's basically you can't put the pulling unit on the back of that machine. This one allows us full 360 capability. Um, the, way that, the way that this is built here is these rods come out, and then we take these ramps off, we flip this bracket, and then we can actually unload the suspension right here, take the wheel off the car, get in there if we have to do any stress relieving or disassembly, and then we have another bracket that goes on there and pushes the tire back up in the air, and then you just fold it back up and put it back together. It's an amazing piece. I, I find myself using this now more than probably any any other system in the shop for just i mean we use it for blueprinting i like to get the cars up in the air and go around it um we're i'm using it for pre-delivery checks because i want to get up and get underneath and make sure that the technicians put all the shields and everything back on and it's so easy to just drive on and lift um i do i have to measure the wheelbase so i do want to let you know i mean those the wheel i guess stance or pads or whatever that you see they move up and down 360 as well as the, the pull tower does. So if I just measure um, the wheelbase and get center to center of the wheels and then adjust accordingly, I'm good to go. So, Correct. Yeah, um, the, the wheel pockets, they do slide back and forth. Yeah, for different so you saw Larry and I had a car on, the, on it uh, Friday when we were doing our pre-delivery check on our Toyota. But I, I haven't, I mean, I'm using it for so much stuff now. And the clearance isn't bad. So, I mean, one of the things you can't, you can't sink these, correct? You, you can. Want, yeah. yeah. Yes. So I don't like to pit anything. Just, just that's a personal preference. Larry's the same way. Yeah, I don't like um, to pit. But the clearance isn't bad. So, so far, I mean, we're getting a lot of cars over it. I mean, I'm sure if I brought in some more little, you know, racy car thing, you know, it's not going to have that clearance to get over that. I'd be dragging the bumper off. But and for the most do, part, well, it's good. We actually, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's 100 millimeters or so, um, and we, we do have it in different configurations. Uh, we have another one, same, same platform, 
It's just it has decking all the way down it. And that's called the Nordic um, in Norway. Um, that's a very popular machine because every stall has to have a lift in it. So <clears throat> that has decking on it, so that actually reduces the I can think of a height. lot of technicians right now that are going, God, I wish that was that way over here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but they use them, you know, disassembly uh, stalls and things like that. So there's, yeah. we d do have a couple different configurations available. Yeah, your teardown but, bays, your technician bays. Um, I, I feel for a lot of techs that I see, you know, so you go to most shops and most of them maybe have one bench. But I may have a then lot of... Then you go to Larry's place. Yeah, then <laughs> you go to Larry's place. But, but for most traditional shops that aren't Larry, I mean, you have one bench over there, that's your structural bench. And if I was the tech and some other tech was on it, and I'm waiting for him to get off. And, and so we see a lot of welding and part replacement being done on the floor. And while some OEs allow that and some don't, just it, the quality of the repair is better when I can really get to where I need to get. So if I can lower that down and do my upper repairs, you know, my upper welds or whatever, raise that and do my lower. It's just better, nicer, I'm happier, mm -hmm. right? I can't imagine laying down. I think, oh, look at this one. On bolts, this, right? Yeah. You know, this height here would work for most, most body tech. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh, right. Even Greg, and he's short. Yeah, I'm just kidding. I'll, I'll just <laughs> I'm, 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 you know. He's going to can you drop that a little bit for me? Uh, yeah, it's good unless Greg has to get something out of the car. Yeah, and this also, if we're going back, Jason, to aeronomics, we talked when we were talking about spot welding that too often technicians, you know, we have that assist cable for a reason. And they're like, I don't want to do that. And part of it is because they're trying to get too low or whatever. This solves the problem. Bring the car to the welder. Don't take yeah. the welder to the car. I like it. I like it. All right. Well, Bob, I'm, I'm sorry. Spray booth. Spray booth. Um, oh, I got a question coming in. All right, y'all talk about a spray. You can put that in a spray booth? Well, you could in a prep station. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, you might want to uh. make sure that you wrap it so you don't get it all over, over spray on it. Well, that's what <laughs> the intention would be, so you can yeah. get in there and look at um, Larry, we're going to take this one because oh, no. we have a setup and measure class. And the question is, how many hours can you charge an insurance company for setup with Select? So you're not charging it nothing. Mm -hmm. You can't charge an insurance company anything unless you're working on the their insurance car. company's particular car themselves. They don't it's, even own their own cars. Right, we, yeah, we used to do those through fleet companies. It's, it's the consumer that, that, that you're charging for that. And, um, you know, I have a whole system that I've, you know, done time test studies for certain shops uh, for court cases and stuff on, on the setup times for different apparatuses or um, the same apparatus, same bench system, let's say, that would take to go yeah. through the repair procedures. So, so the truth of it is I'll break you down because I was part of that problem in 1996 that came up with a two hours of setup right which there, is a lie <laughs> right so there is no such thing as a as two hours of setup so we that kind of got out into so, the industry it took no over such thing as a flaw flaw and, setup of and, and it went so my setup time is different with every car that comes in the shop because my setup process is different regardless of what system i'm using whether you know whatever brand or manufacturer of, of measuring system or bench system that you have each car is going to require different things to set it up. Sometimes it's different R and I's. Sometimes it's different um, um, time to put the anchor plan together. It's it's always different. So there is no such thing as that's what I'm going to pay you every time. We got into a habit as shops of just accepting that, and then it became kind of a of a standard across the industry. And we're going to have to take that back because as EV rolls out, the setup pressure processes will be drastically different. So it already is with most cars, but it's going to get drastically different so what you need to do is make sure that you're breaking things out so I have to do all the R and I's necessary to see the car and see what I need to do I have time to put it on the bench right that's not free either and then I have to determine what my anchor plan is to know that's now I'm ready for setup so I may have 15 16 lines on my estimate before I even get to set up once I've looked at what it's going to take to set it up that may be an hour right it may be two or three I may have an hour to do setup over for my blueprint measurement, and then once I verify there's damage, I'm going to have another setup once I get over to the bench to actually make the repairs. Right. So we have to stop thinking about, you know, in traditional hours and start thinking about what am I actually going to have to do to the car and list that out. Um, full disclosure, it's not easy because the industry has been so trained to think that setup and measure has a specific singular time that it's often a difficult negotiation to have, and that's why we always tell you this is this is for the customer, not the insurance company, and we got to make sure they're on the Well, they the didn't page. understand back then, and somebody's group really didn't understand 
you know, what went into everything. Oh, no, you we, would see, you uh, would see some asinine <laughs> two-hour setup oh, no. and nine hours of pull time. Full disclosure. Uh, listen, I'm talking. Yeah, but no one's Zip listening. Zip it. <laughs> um, the, you know, so you'd have two hours set up and nine hours pull time, or six hours pull time. It's like, what are you doing for six hours? You know, and I go back to that, brrr, bing, 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 bing. I mean, you, you're doing that for six hours, you're jerking around. Right. You know, I have a, and I'm not going to say it here, I have other classes that I teach it in and stuff like that. I'm not going to do this here now, but I have very little, you know, pull time on mm -hmm. stuff. Right. Now, if I'm pulling a left and right side, the pull time might be equal on both sides, it might only be an hour. Okay? Yeah. And then to move the tower. But the setup time might be three, four, five times. I mean, look, you could set up an Audi A8 to change a B pillar with the side gantry, and you could be in the six to nine hour range. I'm just going to give a range like that. You could have a six to nine and zero pull time because it's aluminum. Right. You're not allowed to pull it, it's a chop and change. Right. Right. And well, that also includes dropping that gantry up and down a few times as I put the B pillar on and off and I do test it, and I have to put the gantry back up again. Thank God you guys made it now out of aluminum. Instead of the old steel, you needed nine guys to lift it and put it up and down, which was very, very heavy at one that time. That was the body shop. We're making program. adjustments as <laughs> we age. Yeah. Right? Because <laughs> the body tech is getting older, we have to make our equipment lighter. Right. Yeah. I, here's what we have, to, we have to think about. It was, it was like 95, 96 when we started that whole two hours of setup and measure thing. It wasn't something that we just set up in the Ivory Tower, Illinois, and said, here you go, here's yeah, some time. They just made up lies. We, we had brought companies in. They were part of the study. <laughs> right, so because they wanted to sell their equipment they, they, and lie also. They thought they were selling their equipment. It was lies to on top of lies yeah. on top of lies, but and people were scratching their head. Here's the thing that's different. That car looks nothing like what the 96 Tempo oh. that was in my stall for the test looked like. You know, that car was wide open underneath. It was wide open up top, and now cars have changed, and their tolerances have changed in their construction, not just in the materials the metal is made of, but in all of this cladding and moldings. And there's, you know, there's more plastic on these cars now than I've ever seen before, and you get under a Volkswagen these days, and it's slick as glass because they have all these shields for ergonomics and gas mileage and all these things. So it's just... It's just different. So we have to kind of throw that away, and, and we've got to change the way that we write estimates. Now, real quick, we got another comment. Shout out from the Night Shift podcast, uh, the shirt. Um, <laughs> you, Alejandro. We'll so Alejandro has seen the shirt, and everybody's commenting on that as well. <laughs> um, one thing, I'm not going to let you guys out of the building yet without talking about what Larry's blocking over here, the Trioxy clean. Um, <laughs> I was told to stand here. Yeah, well, And move. then you kept blocking my camera view. I got to talk to my Here's agent. I'm just doing. not getting. Here's what you I, need I, to I do. know that. Over but. here. Okay. Mm. Okay. <laughs> So yeah. when we well, you do that, I gotta go get this iCar roundtable started. So okay. You guys, you're, you're on your own now. So we got it. Okay. All right. So, 11 o'clock. Starting the iCar roundtable. Roundtable. So uh, visit the Facebook page. Okay. And uh, be posted Facebook page. There, so. All right. So thank you, Jason. Traxy Clean has been wildly popular. It's doing very, very well. Too well, I think, in some respects. Right. We have shops. So I just want to make sure I covered this real quick. We have shops out there that there are grants available from state and cities that will pay for a trioxyclean for you to put in your shop. We've had several shops order them based on the grants that Correct. they've gotten. Um, Bob, we're sold out right now. Yeah, um, we, we have a ship coming in to dock, um, and I, almost every unit on that ship is, is pre-sold. We still have a couple left, but, um, but I, I think we're maybe down to three, two, three units. Sure and then um, when's the next ship coming? I think, I think it's gonna be the end of the year, so December, maybe mid-January, okay. um, but we, we did ramp up um, the amount of uh, units we're bringing in because of the popularity. So uh, next, next shipment will be 100. Um, this ship was supposed to be in uh, Sunday at the dock in LA. It got pushed out. I don't know if, the, if there was no room for it to dock or whatever. So I haven't gotten an update yet today, but hopefully it's, hopefully it's in. And as soon as they, they get unloaded, we'll start and uh, drop shipping. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, so a couple of things to think about. We love this tool. You've seen the pictures. We made a Cool Tools video about it. I can sanitize the complete car in 10 minutes, and it doesn't require any, I don't want to say effort or labor by my technician. We basically drop the hoses in, but I'm not in the car and climbing around and touching plastics and wiping stuff off and spraying stuff on any screens or, or you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about aroma or odor and the chemicals that I'm using to clean and desanitize the cars and my customer coming back, picking it up and having an, uh, a reaction. It lets me pre-clean the car to protect my people. It lets Correct. me post-clean the car before I deliver it back to the customer. Quick, easy, hands-off, so to speak. 
Um, and I think, you know, when we thought we might be over this, we're probably heading right back into it here at the end of the year. More Seems states like and cities are, are, are shutting down. Right. So we just want you to know that, that while we're sold out now, we got more coming. But please be aware that, that this is actually a tool that there is grant money available if you will go, you know, so do some research. You may have some state grants, some city grants we found. There's some federal grants out there mm -hmm. that because this is, this is a COVID cleaning and sanitation machine that you can get a grant and get it out there. Now, once you get this machine in there, we've had some shops that are doing some amazing stuff. They're cleaning daycare vans as right. a side business right now. So police cars, police ambulances. cars, ambulances. I was say the police cars, are, that's a big one, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think. They, they deserve to have something like this. Well, yeah, my, so my, one of my dad's, <laughs> ho he always called it a hobby, but he, he was a volunteer sheriff's deputy. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the people that they would have to haul in um, down to the county jail, <laughs> you definitely wanted to clean your car when it was over. Yeah, you um, leave them in there. Yeah. The so, I mean, we had the, um, the local police department was in the parking lot yesterday and, and they're like, hey, we want to throw our vest in and things that can't wash, they'll exactly. throw them in the car and they'll run a cycle through them. But, right. but it's a great community service tool, but it's also an, another business line to my shop. So the daycare vans, you know, the, you get a hundred dollars a van and they want to do, you know, 22 vans a week. That's a you know pretty good. I'm thinking the one daycare we have here in town. That's right. a pretty good revenue chain. And there's yep. no Bob. I don't have to add. I don't pour in chemicals. I'm not putting anything in here, right? No, no magic potions. No, uh, no filters to change. No, it just does its thing. All it needs is 110. 110, 110 power. power. And then it, it does it. So I can actually. Yep. This thing and doesn't weigh much either. This is another one of these things that y'all did that I almost broke my nose because I thought this was going to be crazy. I was trying to get over an extension cable. I was like, I got this. And almost like, because it weighs hardly like nothing. <laughs> Yeah, it weighs hardly nothing, so and, I can. And besides the the whole virus thing, um, I mean, it eliminates all the odors. Yeah. So uh, that's the added benefit. You know, it's going to take out smoke. It's going to take out body uh, smells, paint smells. You know, when the car comes out of spray booth, sometimes right. it's got that odor. Uh, it's it eliminates all of that. Right. All the and, solvent smells go. And so. like you said, you you bring the car in, you hook the trioxy clean up, you run a cycle. Now you've protected your employees for any virus that might be inside the vehicle. And then when you get done with the car, after it's done detail, the last step is put the tracks clean again, deliver a sanitized vehicle back to your customer. Yeah, and if you watch our Cool Tools video, we, we show you our method for that. We do seal the door, the driver's door, so that the customer knows. It's almost like cutting open a crime scene almost. But right. the customer knows when they come back to pick the car up that they're the first ones to enter it. So they mm -hmm. don't have to worry about, hey, was that porter you had drive my car around? He looked like he was sneezing. Is he, you know, <laughs> how's he doing today? But they know they're the next ones that entered the car and, and, and that no one's been in there since them. And it's right. that added sense of security for them that they have. Um, but you definitely, if you're, if you're thinking about a machine, I'm going to strongly encourage you to go ahead and get on the order list for the next boat that comes in. <laughs> Your ship has sailed. Bob. <laughs> um, so for the next boat that comes in and then look into those links uh, to those grant money because, you know, free tools is, is pretty That's awesome. Right. Um, and this machine's going to go on for years, you know, after 2020 is long in our rearview mirror. So, guys, I appreciate you coming out and walking through the shop and showing everybody, you know, what we have here. We, um, uh, we thank you for inviting us. It's been, uh, been, been great. It's been great equipment to add. I was, I'm the first to admit, if you've watched the shows, I was scared of Silet. Uh, it wasn't what I was used to here in Arkansas. There's not a lot of Silet rolling around. Right. Wasn't even a lot of Silet rolling around at our Mercedes dealership. But there wasn't a lot of Silet rolling around here. Um, and so it was intimidating. And I, but finally getting into it, I, it's, it was easy peasy. So mm -hmm. I waited a little too long to jump on the wagon, but now I'm there and y'all can't get rid of me. Sorry. <laughs> so, all right. Well, we are back this afternoon. I believe I'm going to get an off camera cue. Is it noon? Yeah, we're back at noon. Subaru will be in the house along with AirPro Diagnostics. And we're going to be talking about that Subaru scanning and calibrations and eyesight and what makes a Subaru a Subaru and what it takes to fix that Subaru. So we'll see you back here at noon. And if you have some time, jump over and join the iCar RTS Roundtable. Ask any questions you have of the iCar team. They would be happy to answer them um, along with classes, repairs, and the RTS portal, which we use daily. So we'll see you back at noon.